gist of it is that we've come up with a new microprocessor architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, we came up with this in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when I founded the company. The premise was that all computing is parallel. Mm -hmm. It needs to be yep. going forward. And so we need a from scratch architecture. Wow. Uh, not, none of the legacy Intel x86 mm -hmm. or even ARM is going to cut it in the future. And so I've been working on this for seven years now. Wow. Uh, so the architecture is the base. And mm -hmm. then from there, we build actual physical silicon chips. Mm -hmm. We build uh, computer boards. Wow. Uh, and you go from there. Are you actually building like an Erlang machine, kind of like the Lisp machines in the 80s? It is a traditional CPU. Mm -hmm. right? So it's uh, uh, you can think of it as a as a von Neumann architecture, mm -hmm. right? Running a program, but there's thousands of them on a single chip. Wow. Uh, and all communicating with the network. Wow. And uh, so the machine itself, because it's a complete Turing machine, mm -hmm. it can run anything uh, if you have enough resources, right? It can run C, it mm -hmm. can run uh, theoretically Erlang, wow. right? but, um, but until today, mostly runs C. How did you actually, like, when does a founder sit down and say, I want to build a new uh, computer architecture? and the world needs to actually be built of essentially many supercomputers. So it took me about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I, I worked at a company called Analog Devices for 10 mm -hmm. years. They, they do a lot of uh, analog circuits and mm -hmm. DSP stuff for everything, right? Mm -hmm. They've got like 100,000 customers. Yep. And so I, I spent 10 years there. Eight of those years were spent building a very complicated CPU mm -hmm. for uh, wireless communication. Hmm. And we spent about $100 million doing that wow. with a team of 100 people for wow. eight years. And uh, after, you know, and that failed, mm -hmm. and then I got laid off. Ugh. But then I got rehired, mm -hmm. and then I spent two years doing really tiny kind of microcontroller circuits for cameras mm -hmm. uh, with a team of one, two, three people. Wow. And so I saw, all right, so you can have a 100-person team design something really complicated and spend $100 million, <laughs> or you can take a three-person team and do, you know, basically, you know, churn out chips every three months. Wow. And make a lot of money on it. Interesting. And so um, with those two experiences, gave me the courage to start my own. Huh. And then um, looking at all the applications that we were doing at analog devices, everything looked like a pipeline or everything had inherent parallelism. Mm -hmm. So it was very easy to imagine where it would go. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I thought, you know what, instead of having 100 people designing this monster, mm -hmm. one guy can design a parallel machine in his basement. That was the premise. So did you design a parallel machine in your basement or the equivalent? Uh, exactly. In my really? <laughs> oh my gosh. So how long did it actually take you from like conception to actually having a chip? I started 2008 mm -hmm. on Pi Day mm -hmm. uh, and uh, by June I taped out the first chip. Still, wow. still a single person company. Really? Uh, June, June of next year. So a year and two months. Very cool. Yeah. So you're still solo founder? Yeah. Wow. And so, and you're actually printing chips, printing boards. How does, like, I know that NVIDIA has actually been trying to do, like, kind of GPU supercomputing mm -hmm. on, like, it's a co-processor that actually do specific types of computing on it. Mm -hmm. How would your processor essentially compare to some of the NVIDIA, oh, what's their product name? The Tesla uh, or yeah, like the, the NVIDIA or Tesla, something? Yeah, yeah, something like that. I mean, it's, it's just a matter of tuning the knobs, really, mm -hmm. right? You have, what do you have in a processor? You have math units, like yep. loading point units. You have a CPU scheduler mm -hmm. that runs the instruction stream. You have a memory system, you have mm -hmm. I.O. And so when you start tuning those knobs, you, you paint something, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so in a graphics process, it came out of the graphics world. Yep. Initially, they were a very fixed function thing. Yep. And then the time, GPUs have gotten more and more sophisticated and they start looking more and more like a CPU. Mm -hmm. And so, um, whereas this was coming out from, no, we're gonna replace everything. Hmm. Everything's gonna look completely different in hmm. the future. And uh, um, so I didn't really have a, a solid application in mind when I started, mm -hmm. except to say that I was looking at medical, mm -hmm. I was looking at uh, image processing and mm -hmm. things like that, and communication, right? Those were the areas. Yeah. Um, but there was no killer app that said, like the graphics processor that said, we're just gonna render pixels. That's mm -hmm. what we do. Um, Interesting. I'm not quite as smart as the hardware guys, but when I know that the software stack actually starts to kind of grow and grow and grow, there's a lot of stuff that kind of get dragged along that you never actually see, you never actually use, and you end up having kind of code bloat. VMs sometimes get old and kind of crufty and huge. Software stacks can get long in the tooth, and then you start doing optimizations and that sort of stuff. Not being a hardware guy, I'm assuming that that sort of stuff also happens in like x86 architectures sure. or ARM architectures, Abs that sort of thing. Absolutely. So one of the one of the things I uh, I knew when I started the company was that if you're a designer that wants to implement something, if somebody gives you a spec or a mm -hmm. standard, 
you're basically designed with both hands tied behind your back. Mm -hmm. You can't move left or right. Yep. Um, and so, but by writing your own spec, you can do anything. Mm -hmm. And so, when somebody wrote the x86 instruction set mm -hmm. in the 80s, and now some poor designers at Intel have to implement it, <laughs> I'm sure all of them are swearing, saying, yeah, but if you could just <laughs> remove this instruction, I could, I could make everything so much simpler. Right? Interesting. But they can't do that yeah. because you break binary compatibility. And it's, it's very important to mm -hmm. have binary compatibility. It makes the ecosystem much easier to use, mm -hmm. right? You have faster time to market and all that kind of stuff. Yep. But there's a huge cost. Wow. So, um, so like, for example, we've at, um, we took some of our chips mm -hmm. uh, and our customers benchmarked them versus Intel mm -hmm. and we were 25 times more efficient than Intel processors. Wow. Uh, at the same technology node. Wow. So, I mean, 25x is a big number when you normalize them. Now, is that actually per CPU node? That is per operation. Okay. So what really matters is how yes. much energy do you consume doing some work, right? Mm -hmm. That's the universal. So so doing some task, mm -hmm. we were 25 times more efficient. Wow. Which means basically you can imagine battery that can last 25 times longer, right? So instead of lasting one day, it lasts a month, hmm. right? Or, you know, driving a car from South America to Sweden, right? On one tank of gas. Mm -hmm. I mean, 25X is a big number. Huge. Uh, and that's nothing magical that we did. It was just shows you what happens when you cut away the legacy and you start from scratch. What types of computations, what types of programs, programs are your customers actually using your chips and ports for? So the two areas, mm -hmm. the ones that we started with, the communication, mm -hmm. right? So implementing uh, wireless modems. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is it's, um, it's very easy to do, implement one standard and one modem, mm -hmm. right? You can have LTE or GSM and you say, all right, I'm gonna make a block. All it does is the receiver and the transmitter mm -hmm. fixed function. But what if you want to implement every modem in the world that's ever been, mm -hmm. right? Like software-defined radio, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's always good to make things software programmable. Well, then you need a true CPU. You can't have a fixed modem for every modem yep. because you're going to run out of space and, and cost. And so that's kind of been our sweet spot is mm -hmm. make it programmable, mm -hmm. but not as programmable as a general purpose CPU because mm -hmm. then it's just going to be too big. So smaller devices, lower power, but that it still need a lot of different iterations in terms of the software types that you can actually run on it. Interesting. So how many cores do you guys actually have on a chip right now? So I brought one. So this is our, uh, our Raspberry Pi equivalent. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a 64 core version. Banana for scale. <laughs> It's a normal size banana. <laughs> so this is your Raspberry Pi equivalent. Yes, yeah, to parallel computing, right? So the, mm -hmm. the, the premise of the Raspberry Pi was they're going to teach uh, kids how to do programming, yep. right? Because people have forgotten. Yep. Since, you know, people grew up with you know, like the uh, BBC Micro or the yeah. Commodore 64, right? Yep. I mean, they knew how to program from the bare metal. Mm -hmm. And today, most people are programming on, on top of one virtual machine or another, mm -hmm. and uh, it's so abstracted away. So. One of the problems we found was we had no software ecosystem. So mm -hmm. either we build it ourselves, that's very expensive. I mean, that can yeah. easily run into $100 million building your own software ecosystem from scratch. Yeah. And there were no parallel programmers out there. Yeah. I mean, we, we've, we've, we met them at NASA, at DARPA, at supercomputing labs, Los Alamos. You know, that was easy. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, they tend to not talk a lot about what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it didn't really help us. So when we went out and talked to universities and, uh, and companies, mm -hmm. very few people knew how to do parallel programming. Yep. I mean, this conference in code mesh that the Airline Solution organized is, is the exception. Wow. Right? I mean, they absolutely, but, but for the most part, the mainstream enterprise didn't know. Yep. And so this was our concept of how to do a, an accessible, open source, cheap platform for parallel computing. Wow. We, we kickstarted this in 2012, uh -huh. uh, raised about $900,000. Wow. Uh, ended up shipping, at that time, 6,000 of them wow. all over the world. And um, yeah, $99 retail, so. This is fantastic. So you said this has how many cores on it? This particular one has 66 cores. 66 cores. And this was three years ago, so I'm assuming you could probably put almost an order of magnitude on it in the next generation? The number of cores you put is all about need and, and, uh, and economics, right? Yep. So we could have designed a thousand cores mm -hmm. three years ago. Yep. And, but there was nobody knew, who knew how to do what to do with 64 cores. So what yeah, are they going to do with a thousand cores, right? So, yep. so we, we're kind of stepping it up. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're at a point where customers are interested in a thousand cores, we can design it for them. Interesting. But, um, uh, because we are kind of a, a very small five person type startup, mm -hmm. there's no way we can take the risk. And, and because a chip to design is expensive, right? yeah. we're talking about millions of dollars. 
So do you go out and take the risk that, you know, spend millions of dollars mm -hmm. hoping that the market is there with yep. no commitment from customers and then, you know, when are they going to put in production? Because mm -hmm. you don't get money until you sell the chip yep. and that could be three years from now, five wow. years from now and you have to survive until that point. So, so we've kind of changed our, our business strategy a little bit. We don't do as much R&D on risk. Mm -hmm. Now it's if somebody wants to work with us, Mm -hmm. We can make it happen, but wow. the customer needs to be there um, from day one, basically. Interesting. So, did you start the chip company? Did you start your bootstrapping? I'm assuming, or do you actually have you taken funding? Oh yeah, no, we have at this point. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So we've we've taken in some uh, um, some VC funding mm -hmm. and also strategic funding, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Ericsson Communication from yep. Sweden uh, is one of our biggest investors. Very cool. Uh, and. Uh, um, they've actually written some white papers that show what they're doing with it yeah. and, and they show that 25x factor versus Intel. Wow. Uh, so yeah, so we've, we've been doing this for seven years mm -hmm. and uh, so building chips and hardware and boards for seven years, yeah, you kind of need to take out, take in some money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you. But it's fantastic that you actually, that there's a number of customers that are actually using these primarily in the telecommunication space. So yeah, so we have the, the big customers are in the telecom. Okay. I mean, that's, that's you know, the, the easy one. Mm -hmm. um, but then we have a very long tail of users that include uh, robotics, mm -hmm. drones, mm -hmm. uh, researchers, um, every government lab, NASA, uh, 200 universities. Wow. Uh, so it's, it's very broad. We have 10,000 customers. Wow. That's fantastic. Um, I would imagine that something like this would be pretty badass for computer vision algorithms mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff. Absolutely. The, the problem, the, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the big you know, white elephant problem is the software. Yep. You have to rewrite the software. Yep. Right? So when you look at the stack, if you have a uh, computer vision researcher at a university, mm -hmm. he's not going to have time to rewrite the stack because yep. you know, he's pressured to publicize yep. and publish and result, results. And, yeah, some people can work on source code, mm -hmm. um, but you have to hit the right level. Mm -hmm. right? So, for example, there's a, a very popular library called OpenCV, yep. and which is you know it's built for uh, single-threaded machines, yep. Intel, right? And you compile and it runs, fantastic mm -hmm. piece of work. But to make that run in parallel, you have to rewrite the whole library. I mean, there's no no way around it, right? Yep. It doesn't scale to 64 cores. Yep. Uh, and so now we go, all right, so there's like all right, like a million lines of code in OpenCV, oh right? God. So <laughs> should we rewrite that? No, probably not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we can't afford to do that. Yep. Um, and so wherever we would look, where, where there was high-performance computing, mm -hmm. mathematics, linear algebra, or um, uh, OpenCV, mm -hmm. you always have this core library that you need that everybody uses, mm -hmm. and, and you have to just, you have to get through it. Wow. Um, and so that, that's been a huge challenge. This is fantastic. So where are you guys going next with these? Bigger core counts, yep. uh, finding a foothold in enterprise, mm -hmm. which is now finally starting to happen. Cool. And so if you look at architectures, you really need, besides the community, you need a big sponsor to make it happen. Yep. Um, and so um, you know, Intel's been around forever, so, you know, but for them it was the personal PC, right? Mm -hmm. That was the breakthrough. Yep. Um, and, uh, ARM, if you look at ARM, yep. mobile phone, yep. and disk drives, right, yep. in, in the early days. And uh, today they're dominant, mm -hmm. uh, the ARM architecture. And so for us, over the last two years, we've kind of been looking at that, mm -hmm. like what is our enterprise golden goose? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's coming together. Very cool. What's the power usage on something like this compared to like an Arduino, an ARM? It's hard. I mean, you have to look at the performance. Yeah. It, you know, at the end of the day, you always have the normalized performance, performance to energy, right? Power. And so, uh, if you uh, take a Raspberry Pi, probably mm -hmm. runs two and a half watts or mm -hmm. so. This one runs about two and a half to five watts. Mm. So it's more power, but it's got six six CPU cores. Wow. Um, and uh, uh, compare that to an Intel, which might run two hundred watts, mm -hmm. right? Um, which, but a more powerful processor yeah. because it's got all the memory system. Yeah. At the end of the day. Two to five watts is not bad. Very cool. Um, if I want to get one of these, where can I get them? The board is called Parallela. The Parallela board. Yeah, so Parallela.org. Mm -hmm. And you can get from DigiKey, Amazon.com, mm -hmm. uh, Horus Components. Excellent. Very cool. Thank you very much. This is amazing. Right. Great work.